We have had so much fun showing you I.O., but now it's time to hear from I.O. Let's go do some meetups. How many festivals have you been to so far? How many? Festivals? Google I.O. This is my second. It's your second it's Google I.O.? Oh, this is my first one. Uh, this is my fourth. It's your fourth one? Yeah, my fourth as well. Wow, what about well, you guys? The fourth I.O.? Yeah. yeah. There's a fourth I.O.? Yeah. First one for me. First uh, one for me too. I have probably seven festivals. Seven? Oh my gosh, you're a veteran. Yeah. What was your favorite technology that Google came out with this year? Flutter. <laughs> assistant. Everything about the assistant, the updates are fantastic. What's your guys' favorite thing that you've seen so far? Uh, definitely the oh, guy from Disney. Disney. Yeah, great kid. What was the, the name of the people that were dancing on the ice cream van here? The fun engineers. They were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they were so funny. We were I think the live captions seem really, really cool. Yeah. I don't know, I just feel like it's going to change a lot of people's lives. And anything with Google Photos as well. Yeah, for me, for me, it's the environment. All the people, all the, all the people just working in, in something related with technology, and, and I think that's amazing. What is the craziest thing you've ever asked your Google Assistant? Am I hungry? <laughs> Will I ever find a husband? <laughs> I'm just saying there's a ton of men around here. It's true. So I have a, a five-year-old niece and she loves having conversations with, with Google Assistant. And she's like, what's your favorite color? And you want to go to the moon with me? Next I.O., mm -hmm. if Google could do anything, what would you want to see next okay. year? <laughs> smell a vision I love it. I so want smell vision we can hear it. Let's be able to smell it now. A, hop, a car that hovers. I love it. Well, it drives itself as well yeah, at the same time. Yeah, it hovers at the same time. Self-driving a hover car. I would like to see more integration towards humans and artificial intelligence. So it's not about artificial intelligence only, but I think the future that Google <laughs> is trying to build or should build is a combination of artificial intelligence with humans. Google Barber. Google so, Barber? What is that? So think of it, right? Like each time I go to the salon, I want Google to know exactly what, what which haircut I want. So based on my activities or my actions and my previous haircut history, it could basically tell me what exactly I want. If they can do the Google Assistant in Amharic, our local language, if they can support Google in Amharic, that would be oh, awesome. Great. Yeah. What do you want to see next year? AR dog walking? Fox to track? AR dog walking. You heard it here first. It's our next trend. Welcome back, and thanks for hanging out with us on IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan. And I'm Emily Fortuna. Our next guest is a real pioneer, an engineer, physician, and NASA astronaut, Dr. May C. Jemison. What an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. It's exciting to be here today as well. It's a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Definitely. Very bright. <laughs> You've had an extremely impressive career, spanning so many different fields. What do you see as the through lines throughout all of these different fields? So when I think about the things that I've done from, you know, having been a chemical engineer and a medical doctor and then I, uh, an astronaut, and then as soon as I left NASA, I started an international science camp called The Earth We Share. It's an environmental studies professor, 100-year starship. Throughout them is the idea that we're connected, right? And how do we use our technological prowess, our resources, to help better the world writ large. And I know that sounds kind of Pollyannish, but the, my revelation as I've grown up, as I've looked around the world, as I've lived different places, it's that, you know, this planet has incredible resources, but they're finite. The resources include people and their talents that exist everywhere in the world. It includes, you know, our plant life, our animal life, you know, not just, you know, the things you can dig up on the ground. And we have to protect those. And we also have to understand that we share them. And as I go a little bit further, it's like pushing the envelope, not being satisfied with, you know, this is complacent. I, I, I always have to challenge myself. I'm, and perhaps I push, you know, and grab on things that are really, different or difficult, but for me, the energy comes with trying something that I don't know that I can absolutely accomplish it, that it's going to require something new for me, that it's going to require me to grow. Awesome. During your presentation here, you spoke uh, about your 100-year Starship initiative. 
And to introduce it, and I love this, you spoke about how Mars is too close. <laughs> why is that and why should we set our sights further out? So I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. When I was growing up, I assumed that by the time I became an astronaut, right? I actually didn't even want to be an astronaut. I just assumed I'd go into space. But then I'd be going to Mars or one of the moons around Jupiter or Saturn or something. That's what I thought because we had all this things that, these things that were happening. In fact, we had probes on Mars when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. So of course, we'll be doing something more. The reason I talk about 100 year Starship from the perspective of it's more audacious than Mars is because Mars doesn't push us hard enough. We've been on Mars multiple times. We've got Mars address, right? Um, we can figure out the technological timeline to do Mars, the technologies that are needed. The reason we haven't gone to Mars is not so much an engineering challenge, it's a public commitment. But what's gonna really push us is thinking about interstellar, which also captures our imagination. That doesn't mean that we don't do Mars, it means Let's do something that's big and audacious and keep that in our eyesight. So 100 Year Starship was seed funded by DARPA to make sure we have the capabilities for human interstellar flight. But the real underlying current there is innovation. How do we get the radical leaps in knowledge, in technologies, in human systems that would you know, allow us to go to another star system? No, that's, that's the real piece. Because each one of those challenges that we meet can be applied to life here on Earth right today. You can't go to another star system with humans using the kind of energy systems we have today for space exploration. You know, the chemical rockets and propulsion and stuff. We're gonna have to generate tremendous amounts of energy through either a fission where you break an atom apart, uh, fusion like which powers the sun or antimatter. Um, we do fission now but it's not well contained. We don't know how to control it, store it. Imagine if we could just store, learn how to store this. What tremendous value it would have for life here on Earth? When you think about going to another star system, you have to be autonomous. So you have to carry your food with you because if you get to going fast enough, it's a, it's a hard journey, but if you get to going fast enough so that it's reasonable within human lifetimes, you're gonna have to carry everything with you. You're gonna to have to learn how to grow your food, your medical systems. And right now, when we're on Earth, we rely on this wonderful biodiversity of the soil, right? The microbiome in the soil and all of those things to grow food. We need to understand that. We need to know how to keep it healthy. We need to take that with us. And so there are all these pieces, financial infrastructures, we have to change to be able to do something that's that's long term. And if you stop and think about that, those are all things we need to survive on this planet. Space exploration seems inevitable with the requisite what you call Team Earthlings. But at the same time, it seems like we could be moving faster. What do you think is holding us back? I think it's, it's public commitment. It's really, we haven't included people. And so folks don't see how you know, space technology impacts their day-to-day -day lives, even though it does. You know, I live in Houston, Texas. You know, we track hurricanes, right? And that's what we know about. We knew about the ozone, the hole in the ozone from, you know, space information and data. So it's constantly and pervasive in our lives, but we haven't told the story very well. And when I say we, that's, I guess, the royal we about space folks, right? <laughs> and you tell the story better by having people involved. What was riveting people when Mars landed? That they could, you know, the Mars lander, remember everybody was looking and cheering? It's because they could see it, they could be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the piece, and I think that's the piece with all science and technology. When it's accessible, and when people understand that it's part of their lives and it's not this mysterious thing. And they're energized and excited towards yeah. working towards that goal, yeah. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, that space offices and also other, um, technology innovations offer us is that we get to do bigger things and I think people would like they like an adrenaline rush mm -hmm. but wouldn't we like to do good things with adrenaline rush right right now we manufacture adrenaline rushes in ways that are not necessarily so productive, ben productive. there you go <laughs> <laughs> sure how does this uh, relate to your theme of look up and the uh, Skyfi app that you produced so Look Up came from 100 Year Starship and we wanted to connect people with space. Mm -hmm. 
And we also wanted to deal with the issue of human behavior. How do we get the best out of us? And we thought, let's ask people to go out and look up. Like, when was the last time you looked up? Remember as a kid looking up at the clouds and it just made you feel good, right? And then I remember as a child thinking that, you know, there's, there are other children on the other side of the planet who are looking up as well. And what do they see? I know they see the same moon. In some instances, they see slightly different stars, but we're all, you know, it was just one of those connecting things. And so we started to work on how do we create a campaign where one day around the world, we'd all look up. And so, of course, we had to make an app for that, right? <laughs> and that's where the Skyfee app came in. So Sky Selfie. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to take an image, a video, a text, or whatever, when you look up, what does it make you feel, post it, and we would put it on a globe that you can twirl around and you can see what everyone else is doing, and it's time tagged and data tagged to where you are, and you get to see what other people are looking at. Where we came up with is that is we want to do different events, right? So we started on October 18th, one day, I'm proud to say we trended number five on Google, Play, which, is, which is great, but in one day, we we're able to garner lots of enthusiasm and support around the world. Of course, it took a lot of work to build up to that, right? Sure. And now we're continuing to work on it, and we're gonna do one also around the 50th anniversary of the lunar land, and so I'd like everybody to do, can I do this? Sure. The Skyfi app is completely free, mm -hmm. right? No in-app purchases. I know that's like, what is wrong with her? No, it's you know, because we want people to connect and use it. And it's available on Google, it's available on um, iOS systems. And the idea is to really just connect us. And I think, as we were talking before, just the act of looking up from your phone changes your perspective. You get bigger, you look out. You know, just the act of looking up from your desk or your work or just, you know, sometimes I'm walking down the street, I'm looking at the ground, right? Looking up, it frees us. It gives us energy. So I have one more question. And this wait, is on wait, behalf wait, wait, wait. You're gonna blame. You're gonna blame Timothy. Uh, Timothy asked me to ask this question. Between <laughs> the two of us, the biggest Star Trek nerd is probably me. Okay, shoot. So uh, I know that Nichelle Nichols is a huge inspiration to you, and I personally believe that representation in media and in, in just in media is super important. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask how you got your guest appearance on Star Trek. <laughs> so <laughs> let me just start off by saying when I was growing up, I was, I love Star Trek. Uh -huh. I was in Los Angeles before I was accepted into the astronaut program. And I used to get my hair cut in LA. And the person who cut my hair was uh, Stefan Demings, who was a hairdresser from all mm. these movies and things like that, and he knew LeVar Burton. And Stefan and I were talking one day, and he said, uh, May, would you like to be on, you know, why don't you should be on Star Trek? And I said, really? He said, I'll, I'll mention it to LeVar. So he mentioned it to LeVar. I got a call one night. I was at home, and it's like, hey, May, this is LeVar Burton. Would you be interested in being on Star Trek? That's what Stefan said, and I was like, yeah, sure. Right? <laughs> like, this is when the glasses come off. Yeah, sure. Um, and they wrote a part for me as Lieutenant Palmer. That's awesome. And that's what happened. Basically, it was an episode LeVar was uh, uh, directing, and it was really very neat. And I able, was able to go around and sort of been sort of one of the Star Trek buddies since then, and was even able to help them when they premiered the Star Trek Discovery on uh, back last year in New York. That's, That's wonderful. Really cool. Yeah, so cool. All right, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to tell our viewers? Well, all this discussion we're having now is really around science and technology and some of those issues. And it's really important that we understand that, you know, we research science and problems based on the people who are there, their ambitions, their dreams, their goals, their fears. And so it's really important that we have as many people as possible doing that work. Mm. We design technology and tools based on the people we are. It's important that we have lots of people involved. And we 
fail to develop and use so much of the talent in this country. So I spend a lot of my time around science literacy, mm -hmm. and I think it's vitally important that every child have an opportunity for an excellent education, that every child is science literate. As adults, that we don't sort of say, oh, I don't know about that, you know, it's, that's not cute, you know? We need to make sure that we're fully engaged, and that's my task, to yes. be inclusive and bring lots of people along. Here, awesome. here. Dr. Jemison, thank you so much for joining us on this show today. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I get thank to shake hands. I'll <laughs> shake hands. Thank Excellent. you. And what could be more appropriate to follow this talk than a demo with its own Mars rover? Take it away, Todd. Hello, IO viewers. So I am here with Amanda in the Augmented Reality booth. And uh, Amanda, you're going to show me something cool from the NASA website. Yeah. So here you can see on the NASA website, they're showing 3D models of their rovers. Here we have the Curiosity rover. And they're actually using the model VR web component to put that 3D asset on their website. Oh, that's very cool. Now, you said it's a, it's a web component. So do they need to like NPM install something to get it working? Or? It's actually markup. Oh. Uh, so very simple to just put on your website. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, that's very cool. And this 3D model, um, like what, what file format is that? Yeah. So we recommend using GLTF, uh -huh. um, but it also supports USDZ and GLB. OK, and is that something most like commercial 3D modeling tools will export to? You should be able to export to that easily. I see you've got that little button down there in the, in the bottom right. What does that do? Yeah. So this actually is the new feature that we're launching at I.O. today. And what it allows you to do is open up what we call Scene Viewer. So Scene Viewer allows you to take this 3D models uh -huh. and actually place it in your real world space. Whoa, no way. So here you can see the Curiosity rover at scale. Wow, it's like there's a real life spaceship here in the booth, but not really. It's just very, actually very nicely rendered. It, it, it kind of fooled me. Yep, and so you can actually manipulate this in your own space. So you'll see it at full scale, but you can also shrink it down so that it can actually fit in your living room. Ah, OK, yes. I, so if I want to put the Curiosity rover on my coffee table, I now can just by shrinking it down a little bit. Yep. And so how did you get the um, how did you get the size specification? Like apparently this was built real life or this is showing it in real life and you're able to shrink it down? Yeah, so NASA when they built the 3D model decided to build it at scale. Okay. And so that's the model we're referencing. Gotcha. Yes. Very cool. Um, and so and if I'm a developer and I want to turn my model viewer component into this cool scene viewer augmented reality experience what do I have to do? Yeah, so there's no need to build an app for this. Okay. All you actually do is go into the markup and you add the AR attribute, which is literally the letters A and R. That, so I gotta super type, simple to do. <laughs> I type two letters and I get all that. Yes. All right, well, that, that sounds easy. I think yeah. even I could do that. Yeah. Well, I could use a little pick me up after that demo. Let's uh, head on over here and see if I can find some caffeine. Hey, How, are you doing? How are you doing, Todd? I am doing well. I'm already excited for this demo because I see there's an espresso machine here. So uh, walk me through what you're showing us today. All right, so what we're doing in here is we're showing an espresso machine coming to life in AR using this technology called augmented images. Okay. Uh, that's part of AR core. You well, want to give it a spin? Let's, yes, let's check it out. All right, so as soon as you look at this marker. So you're showing the image there. Yep. And it's telling you to look around. And now Whoa. it's annotated the machine with okay. information about its features. Let's see the little like pieces this. coming to life. Yep. There's, it's telling you about the dose control guy, uh, grinding. I need my doses controlled. Yeah, and the precise temperature. What okay. would you do without that? And you could actually see an espresso being made here. Oh, fantastic. This is like a really powerful way for manufacturers to show uh, features of their product, which are otherwise just not, which are just lost in text. And this really makes the product come to life yeah, in a really powerful cool. way. And so this triggers the experience okay. once it recognizes. And now what happens once this image is recognized, it starts establishing a correspondence between the phone and the image. So the phone always knows exactly where it is in with response respect, to this. With yes. respect to the image. And when I say it establishes a correspondence in terms of a pose, that's position and orientation. So position in like x direction, in y direction, and in Z direction. 
and also the orientation in three degrees, like pitch yaw and roll. Yep. So the phone knows exactly where it is with respect to the marker. Gotcha. So this kind of works best in places where you sort of have strict control over like the environment in which this image is going to appear and what's around it. Uh, yes. As if you're trying to augment real things, uh, you want to make sure that the image is rigid with respect to the thing that you're trying to augment. Gotcha. But if you just want the image itself specifically to come to life, that's all you need. Absolutely. To so think about like a, a scenario where uh, you're at a store uh -huh. and you want to see what's inside a box. So you could use an app to look at the box. It would recognize uh, the box as a marker, and you could actually have a sneak peek at like what's inside the box. Oh, okay. So like the model could like pop out of the box and I can exactly. see like exactly what my waffle iron or toaster or I need stuff for my kitchen. That's all gonna look without like. even opening it. Without even opening it. And up. then I won't get yelled at by shopkeepers. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ashish. I, I learned a lot about augmented reality today. I'm gonna grab this espresso. <laughs> oh, it's not real. It's but, but the coffee beans are, can, can I eat the coffee beans? Yes, you can. All right, I'm going to take a few coffee beans to go. <laughs> you can take the coffee Thank beans Thank you very off. much, live stream. I'm going to go uh, get caffeinated. AR really spans the outer limits, up to Mars and back down to a simple cup of coffee. Well, one fancy cup of coffee. <laughs> and you have a minute to grab one yourself while we take a quick break. The next sessions are about to begin. You're watching IO Live from Mountain View, California. <laughs> Welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan, and we're honored to have renowned artist Su Gwen Chung here to talk about her work. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> now, I've been looking forward to your performance here at IO, and I'd like to talk about it. But first, how about some background? Uh, when did you start working with robots, and why? <laughs> it's a great question. I get asked that all the time. Uh, I started working with robots about five years ago. I've been kind of a digital nomad. I learned to code when I was quite young and uh, got really interested in ways to take uh, what's present inside the simulation of the computer into the physical world. So um, I started with a really simple uh, drawing collaboration with my first robotic arm and yeah, it's just taken off ever since. Now, how has the experience of, say, human-machine collaboration changed your process as an artist? You know, I, I think about that a lot because I think it has changed it quite significantly. Um, I've gotten more accustomed to chaos, uh, to call it, to, to put it mildly. Um, Things going not the way you expected? Yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, erratic emergent behavior um, or assigned attributed behavior to mm -hmm. working with these machines that, you know, really um, got me out of outside of my comfort zone um, from just my simple drawing practice. I think there's something really uh, gestural and um, you know the cognitive about mark making mm -hmm. that when you do that with the robotic articulated unit it uh, yeah there's a lot of new surprises um, I like to think of working with these machines as a creative catalyst so that ends up being quite inspiring for me interesting all right let's talk about the performance a sure, little bit. Yeah, yeah. now uh, it was beautiful and elegant thank you I expected that part, right? Because I looked at your work online. Uh, what I didn't expect was something completely different, that your relationship with the robots felt, if I can say, gentle and familial, like they were yeah. family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they it's, pretty much are at this point. So. I mean, tell me about that. How much of what you're doing uh, about the art is about that relationship rather right. than the marks that you're making? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I implicate the tool as a collaborator. Yeah. And I think, you know, I frame it as a collaboration because we want to facilitate kind, generous collaborations in the world between humans to humans. And I think uh, when I regard these machines as my collaborators, it's a way of, um, yeah, it's a way of just creating a more empathetic model. In this, in this uh, context, it's behavioral empathy. But um, you know, when I'm on stage performing with these robots, I think it's it's very much me and them and this captive audience, and that uh, mutual reliance and co-creation ends up um, you know spurting a very emotional connection with them. And and yeah, and I think that we've evolved. Like my process has evolved significantly with uh, this collaborative work, and and they have as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's. 
I think it's a positive way of slanting um, anthropomorphism um, that, that's yeah, just been really inspiring for the work. Now, did you have to do anything to build that relationship, like hang out with them outside of work? Or? <laughs> no, we get a few beers every <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's honestly, it's, there's so much vitality and vulnerability when doing these performances that, yeah. um, that you know, we've kind of been in this together with the risk of sounding a bit cheesy has made it feel like a really close connection. Um, in addition to the robotic arms, um, I've been designing a multi-robotic system that's actually a series of 20 painting robots that uh, also is um, a articulation of this robotic form in a, in a different way. Instead of one-to-one, -one, it's one-to-many. And that is a totally different relationship. It's almost like a natural swarm that I'm really excited about. So, so that reframes the relationship too. And yeah, it's, it's, it's like embodied kinetic sculpture um, that's only possible in today's moment. And that really excites me. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the themes of the work that you um, performed here, uh, mimicry, memory, and uh, future speculations. How did you land on those? Uh, so, uh, the mimicry was the first generation. Um, I call uh, my robots uh, Doug uh, because the project is named, yeah, let's just, let's just uh, drop the formalities and, and <laughs> call them what they are. No, I uh, started the uh, project and it's called Drawing Operations Unit Generation 1, it was focused on mimicry and that was Doug 1. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, it's sort of grown over time. Uh, the, it's mimicry, mimicry, uh, mimicry, memory, and future speculations because those are the three chapters of this evolving uh, generational project. I see. So um, I'm really excited about the third because it shows multi robotic collaboration alongside uh, my human drawing agency, and that's very much where the work is headed towards a more uh, collaborative, uh, more collective um, idea. Is there a fourth generation you have in mind? Uh, yeah, there is. Well, the, the third generation is actually the multi-robotic system, which I is see. the painting um, ones. But the, there's a fourth generation that I can't talk about yet. But, okay. Uh, but it's gonna, it'll be coming soon. Awesome. We'll yeah. look forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited to share it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the score for the work by Aquarian, how did yeah. that contribute to the overall uh, work? It contributed so much. Um, Aquarian has been um, a good friend uh, of mine for quite a while and does some incredible music um, that is actually quite, uh, you know, it's it's brilliant. I have to, like I was, I think I was describing it earlier as it's a, it's future, it's futuristic, but also taps into this nostalgia about, you know, uh, jungle and drum and bass mm -hmm. that's really, really interesting. Um, I sort of, Asked him to uh, come up with the score for me, um, and made and you know discussed with him about the themes I'd like him to interpret. So he really came up with a beautiful melodic um, work that uh, really adds so much to the piece. Uh, we were really excited to uh, collaborate with uh, and use the 4D sound system from Monom yeah. and spatialize this work. Uh, one component of the performance that we did, especially for IO, was the integration of um, a contact mic component. So in the beginning, my drawing gestures actually form architectural uh, want, like sound throughout the space. And it was really cool to control like the universe of the performance like that. So we were, we were very excited about it and hope to do it again soon. That's awesome. OK, one more question. Uh, and I have to ask this, what's the biggest surprise your sort of robot partner has ever given you in a performance? That's a, I like your uh, verbiage with that. It's a very, because I do think about it as like giving uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the artistic uh, behavior. I, I think it's been incredibly surprising. I think one of the reasons I've been working with um, neural nets is its uh, ability to, and, and its native ability to generate non-human um, unexpected behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a really interesting way of looking at my own work because I train all my um, neural nets on my own drawings uh, to kind of re-examine the type of work I do and see how it feels to be articulated by a unit. So I think it's constantly surprising me, which is probably <laughs> not a, uh, the answer you're looking for. I don't know, I think that's a great answer. <laughs> I will say um, what I do find surprising about the duets is uh, not only the robot's output, but um, the, the response to it has been really interesting. And it's uh, 
really taken off a lot of speculative questions about uh, technology and philosophy and uh, sort of what it means to make work uh, as an artist today. So that's been the most surprising uh, connection that uh, this, this performance has created for me. Thank you for that. And thanks for sharing your vision and your art with us here at IO19. Thank you. Next up, let's join Wayne for more of The Sandbox. Hi, I'm Wayne Pekarski and welcome to Google I.O. 2019. We're here at Shoreline Amphitheatre where there's a bunch of really cool demos and exhibits and fun things to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a live guided tour of all the really cool stuff here. So let's go and get started. Oh wow, look, so you can see all these augmented reality flowers on here. Oh wow, look, I got augmented reality glasses and hair. So we got Flutter running on iOS and Android devices and tablets and everything. It looks great. And I got a free snack. Oh, wow. Okay, let's try this one here. What's the temperature outside? A perfect day. Exactly. It's always like that at I.O. All right, let's go. I guess I should see what the latest news is from my bosses here. So it's really cool because you can use either a remote control or a game controller and you can control Android TV to play games, watch YouTube videos and see what's going on. Experiments with Google. So what we're doing here is we've got a machine learning algorithm that's been trained with animal sounds and the more accurately you can make them, the faster your little tractor drives around the track here. This is so much fun. How was your experiment? Awesome. All right, so here we're in the gaming area where we're seeing lots of demos, interesting things. These are all targeted at developers who actually make games for Android and web and so forth. So there's a lot of really interesting news and updates for them. But what we should do now is let's go and check out what Stadia has to offer for a demo and let's check it out. So here we have Stadia, which allows us to play games on the cloud. So what do we have here? This is a developer tool demo that we have. So what you see here is we've taken this 2D image and we've trained a machine learning model offline and we can apply it directly in the game at runtime. Oh, well, so you can walk around. Can I play it? Yeah, right. of course. Cool, cool. So this is using shaders or? It's using machine learning technology with shaders. Wow, this is really cool. Thanks very much. All right, let's get out of here and see what else there is. You watch, I can do this. Oh, come on. Oh, I can't do this one. Oh, I got something. This thing is insanely accurate. All right, you can check out my poses on the screen here. Look at this. What a superstar. OK, so this is the Android Auto area, where we have Android that runs in vehicles. So what we see here is that we've got actually a head unit from a vehicle mounted here. And then the phone is projecting onto the screen. And so the phone can allow us to run Google Maps, uh, make phone calls, play music, whatever. So it's really neat because you can do all the same functions from your phone, but you can do it in a nice head unit mounted in your vehicle. Let's go see if we can get a sneak peek inside one of the cars themselves. Come on, let's go. All right, here we have an Android Auto car. So this is exciting. So we've got Google Maps, we've got our phone, we can make calls with it, we can listen to our music. So um, yeah, let's get ready to take a drive. So the Android Auto people would let me take their car. So instead, I thought I'd come over here and try out this virtual moped ride where I get to ride through the streets of Jakarta watching a 360 video on these virtual reality glasses here. It was really cool what you can do with a 360 video when you're sitting in a motorcycle that feels so incredibly realistic. All right, well, that was an amazing whirlwind tour of Jakarta on a 360 degree YouTube video. And this is also a great tour of the sandboxes at Google I.O. 2019. I hope you had as much fun as I did watching everything that's going on here, and I'll see you next time. The Sandbox is such a great place to really become immersed in everything featured at I.O. this year. And if you missed any part of I.O. Live, you're in luck. You can check it all out at g.co slash I.O. slash live. We'll see you after these sessions. Learn to architect and develop Android apps in the Kotlin programming language using industry-proven tools and libraries. Creating Android apps in Kotlin is a course developed by Google together with Udacity. 
You'll learn by building real Android apps using industry best practices with modern app architecture. Understand why and how to use Android Jetpack components such as Room for Databases, Work Manager for Background Processing, the new Navigation Components, and more. You'll use key Kotlin features to write your app code more quickly and concisely. Learning to develop on Android is much more than learning APIs and shortcuts. It's training your brain to think like a mobile developer. Come learn with us. For more information on this free course and to see all of Google's courses with Udacity, go to udacity.com slash Google. One of the things I love about I.O. is the intersection of art and technology, which is why we're able to speak with people like Amit, the director of Google's Arts and Culture, and Google Distinguished Scientist, Blaze. Welcome both to the show. Thank you. How are you doing? Very well. You? I'm just doing really, really great. So, uh, Amit, let's start with some background on the Google's Cultural Institute and Google's Arts and Cultures. How did it get started, and what's the mission? Sure, I think you know uh, most of it is publicly available, uh, but I think the, the the short version is it was a grounds up 20% initiative by a couple of Googlers back in 2010, 2011, uh, to essentially do one very simple thing: to make access to art and culture uh, truly accessible online without any barriers to entry by working with museums, artists, and institutions. And since then, the uh, initiative is now formalized. It's a nonprofit within the company. And essentially, it focuses on telling stories, on getting cultural content onto the internet, and essentially collaborating with amazing artists and uh, great engineers. One of the first things that I heard about was uh, the sort of museum of museums, I think it was called at one point, um, being able to go online and see these works of art in such high detail, right? Like you could even see the sure. brush strokes and that was like an incredible start. What, what are some of the other things? Well, I think we, we are very lucky, you know, when you start a project like this and you work at Google, you get access to teams like, for example, Blazor's team or, for example, the Geo team yeah. that goes and builds cameras for you that allows you to essentially take street view inside a museum uh, or to take high resolution uh, gigapixel images. So these are the kind of like starting points for the experience. And now we have moved into uh, things like art selfies. So, uh, you know, uh, making sure that people uh, have a deeper appreciation for portraits that are lying in museums around the world by matching them uh, to a selfie. And this was one of our uh, features that crossed over 100 million selfies have been taken where people are now finding a new way to interact with art. And that's the one that's using uh, style transfer. Uh, it's an aspect of machine learning, yeah? It is using an aspect of machine learning, yes. Okay. And it's, uh, it's uh, done on device, and it's, uh, it's, really, it's really one of those things that we didn't expect to take off in the way it did, and neither did the museums, <laughs> because they've been just uh, preserving these artworks without understanding that they can be a new relationship with the audience that's not one of education, but one of interaction. That's really cool. All right, let's talk about uh, art and machine intelligence in a little bit more depth. It's, um, I think it's, you've called it an emerging practice. Uh, what are we seeing and uh, where? Like, who's doing what? Well, there, there's, there's actually sort of a natural flow from what Google Arts and Culture started to do um, many years ago and where we began with the Artists and Machine Intelligence program in, in 2015. The, um, the first thing that became possible with deep learning was the analysis. Of, of these uh, artworks and of visual media in general, in which you start to be able to extract the semantics of those things and go beyond exploration, beyond street view type things, and into um, search and semantic analysis. Uh, but then what, what, really, what, what really sort of flipped a bit in our minds was Alex Morfinsev's Deep Dream work. Yeah. Which was, uh, right, you, you remember the oh, trippy squirrel familiar. and all this stuff. It's creepy and beautiful all at the same time. Creepy and wonderful <laughs> and, and, and leaked uh, just, uh, just shortly before we, you know, somewhat accelerated our, our, our need to kind of get, <laughs> get out there with what, with what this actually was. But, but that, was, that was the first time that, that neural nets began to uh, sort of invert. And, you know, there's been, there's been a, sort of a long-running thread in machine learning of, of doing synthesis and not just analysis, but mm -hmm. in, the, in the era of classical machine learning, that wasn't generally very successful because 
uh, you know, the actual machine learning part of machine learning prior to deep learning was very low dimensional. So uh, and everything relied on, on, on feature engineering. You know, you, you write lots of code to reduce whatever media you're talking about yeah. to a handful of dimensions, and then you end up doing regression. And, um, and so inverting through feature engineering is hard. You know, you can do maybe generated faces in a video game with different proportions or something, but you're not going to generate uh, things that are all that realistic or artistically interesting. Um, but with Deep Dream, uh, you know, what the, the realization was that since neural nets work with very, very high dimensional inputs directly and, and don't rely on, on feature engineering, you can turn that engine around the other way and suddenly you have, uh, you have the machinery for not only understanding but also synthesizing media. And, and that, that raises all of these very profound questions. I mean, it's not just new art practices that emerge from that, but new philosophical questions about the relationship of, of creativity and human exceptionalism to computing. And uh, you know, so that's, wh that's, that's where that sort of, those additional layers of cultural engagement came from. Or even the relatively simple question of, are we seeing the output of Deep Dream? Is that the mind of that neural network? Right. Right, like that's... Yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, in the beginning, um, the reason that Alex did that experiment was to do a kind of neuroscience on those on those networks. So originally, it was it was visualization of what those neurons, you know, high up in that neural net were actually sensitive to. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So at I/O, you all have uh, announced the Artists and Machine Intelligence Grants. So what's the goal, and who's eligible? I'm in. I can give a very quick thing and then let Blaze uh, uh, explain more. But I think for, for us, uh, you know, partnering with Blaze's team is natural because uh, they are essentially at the forefront of what's happening in machine learning. And we are trying to get museums and artists to adopt those technologies by creating beautiful uh, prototypes or experiments. So we've launched a program uh, called uh, Google Arts and Culture Experiments. And over there, you get all different types of artists, studios, and individuals who are partnering either with an institution or with a technologist to create a new experiment. And we were trying to figure out how can we further that and how can we maybe structure that in a way that is a bit more appealing. And that's where Blaze's team came in with the idea of the grants. Right. And Google Arts and Culture has always been interested in not only engaging with institutions, but moving upstream exactly. to artists, of course. Exactly. So, you know, it was a, it was a very obvious uh, synergy from the beginning. But um, beyond just just uh, tool making or, or, uh, or building bridges between, between artists and technologists, uh, you know, a number of those grants are actually being given to, uh, to philosophers and theorists, uh, people who are, um, or people who cross over, who are, who are very multidisciplinary, not only between arts and technology, but also, uh, but also thinking, uh, critical, critical theory, uh, uh, media analysis, philosophy, uh, aesthetics. Uh, because, because um, you know, it's, 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 again, it's not just a, a sort of trick for synthesizing trippy images. It's, it, it also is a, um, is a, a tool and a... Um, it's a deeper question, right, about where this goes. Yeah, it's a, it's a tool for thinking about very deep questions, about, about what, what humans are all about, what creativity is all about, what is the future relationship between, uh, between humans and machines and society and so on. So you have very meta topics, <laughs> right. and then you need to find ways that can be easily explainable or communicated uh, to the audience. And that's where I think the synergy of this program is. For us, it's our first attempt. It's the first time we have announced this program together. So we are hoping, you know, uh, the output will be interesting, and then hopefully we can scale it and expand it. And it's so important to involve artists in those kinds of questions. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So let's uh, fast forward. I understand the program runs from September to uh, January of 2020. Uh, in February of 2020, how does the world look different if this goes perfectly well? Well, um, obviously there are works that we hope will come out of, yeah. this, of this whole process that will be uh, beautiful or frightening or engaged discussion <laughs> or all uh, of in those various things. ways, all of the above, <laughs> perhaps. Um, so, uh, so you know, certainly there are, there are artistic outputs that we expect will will happen, but but a, a big part of this is also about advancing dialogue, yeah. and and it's 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 not it's not sort of a, a marketing exercise for Google. Uh, we we have felt from the beginning that the the uh, the the two way dialogue, the influence of a lot of those thinkers on on what we're doing. Uh, in our other work is, is at least as important from our point of view 
as, as just making uh, tools available to, to artists. Thank you for, for being here. Yeah, yeah. And um, if they want to check this out online, there's yeah, a they just got URL, to go, right? Yeah, they just got to go to g.co slash arts experiments. And they can apply for the grants program. They can learn more about RMI's work. And it, it's, it's a fascinating place to be. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank, thank you. you. We're going to take a quick break now, and then we'll be back with more IO Live. It has been a jam-packed I.O. this year, and I'm sorry it's already over. Right? I mean, we've covered so much. It's been an amazing three days. Thank you all for tuning in and experience it with us. Though we're wrapping up this I.O., keep the conversation going with hashtag I.O. 19. And to watch all the keynotes, all the sessions, and all the I.O. Live content, visit g.co slash I.O. slash live, or head directly to the Google Developers YouTube channel. And to stay connected with Google developers, sign up for our newsletter at g.co slash dev slash newsletter. So long from IO 2019. See you in 2020. Good morning, Shoreline. Welcome to Google IO. Thank you all for joining us in person and to the millions around the world watching on live stream. Right, experiments. Let's go check it out. Ram, ram, ram. Today, there are over 2.5 billion active Android devices. The vibe's great, the people here are amazing. The sessions, the food, the people, everything's perfect. Ten years, ten years of our Google developer community. Each of you do so much to help. We appreciate everything you do for us. Here is our friend. <laughs> It's an AR shark, it won't bite. <laughs> oh, that's so nifty. It's a perfect example of what we mean by building a more helpful Google for everyone. <laughs>